I will, I will stand up and yak if you don't mind pressing the next button for me, Jared. Okay. Um, and this is talking about Pass Summit, which I'm hoping I can convince my boss to pay for me to go to, but we'll see how that works out. The, if you, how many here have actually been to the summit? Raise your hand. You only got one. All right. So if you have, if you are not aware, uh, it is the biggest SQL conference uh, pretty much in the world. It's out in Seattle, uh, held every year, and it is. Although I can't drop the names like Jess Borland could, but you pretty much all of the uh, big wigs that are actually developing the next version of SQL Server are generally out there, and you can get to know them, find out what's in the pipe, and learn a lot of interesting stuff. So that is definitely an excellent opportunity. Uh, November 6th through 9th. Uh, in addition, I think it's the next slide, we'll have a promo code for us. Um, <laughs> Insert your code. <laughs> GBD. <laughs> okay. So, uh, apparently, uh, we'll, uh, we'll see what we can do about definitely getting information out there. And uh, Fox uh, at pass.org, is that right? Did I run that right? What is our email? Fox at pass.org. Okay, fox at pass.org. If you are definitely interested in going out and want that information sooner rather than later, email fox at pass.org and we will get that to you directly. Uh, we'll, uh, December, we'll definitely make sure to get that up by next month, updated in our personal slide deck. In is there a benefit to, the, to this group here for that? Because yes. I mean, there's a lot of different um, yep. you know, codes to get them 150 off. And it's pretty much the uh, using the, the group's code you use gets a kickback. I forget how much it exact. I don't know if it's a hundred percent kickback or, or what. But like usually we get, I want to say fifty to hundred dollars per person that uses a code. Something like that comes back to our organization here. Um, so that and uh, uh, any kickbacks we get from Mad Pass uh, cover like sixty percent of our expenses in the year for our meetups. So yeah. Um, all right, next slide. Think. Uh, passion Award nominations. If you know someone who has been doing a lot in the past community, um, helping out in writing some of our conventions or just being an excellent presenter, etc., uh, feel free to uh, contact, go to the web page at the bottom there, and make recommendations. Next. Okay. Solutions preview. This is, if I remember correctly, registration. This should be. Oh, okay. This is just a, a tool preview. I got confused. Uh, Past summit usually has a uh, the day. Excuse me. Prior to the convention has a preview, which is basically just a, a handful of sessions instead of uh, dozens and a lot smaller group at one on one time, which I thought this was. But this is just uh, registering to uh, beta test and get to try out some of the new tools we a little bit before they hit the market. So uh, if you're interested in playing around with new tech that may or may not be stable, uh, that's related to SQL, feel free to uh, join up the Summit Solutions preview. I will say, um, if anybody ever has a chance to go, definitely go as well with it. Um, they do do a really good job of trying to make sure that you get full advantage of the conference as far as, you know, things like that, that pre-summit. And then even when you go out there, they got stuff for, like, if you've never been there before, for newbies and stuff, uh, how to take advantage of Because there's hundreds of sessions and vendors and stuff in this kind of world the first time you get out there. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so pass on Facebook. Are uh, this is new to me, and I think this is new. So I think this is one of our virtual experiences, because I think they're also doing a actual uh, session online. I know later on in our slide deck we usually have quite a selection of our virtual chapters, but if you are too lazy to track them down uh, through the web and you just wanted to use Facebook directly, uh, I guess we're making it a little bit more one stop. <laughs> Woohoo! And then 
and help support Pass if you know any companies in the area who are looking for a sponsor to uh, sponsor the community. Um, we are asking for uh, $100 or more, and in, in exchange for that, we will let them come in and speak here. Uh, we usually give them 10 to 20 minutes beforehand to talk about uh, either their company, uh, the software they have to offer, or if they are a, uh, like a job placement company, what they're looking for, things like that. So if you know anyone who would benefit or be interested in that, let us know. Again, the fox at pass.org. Uh, can help get us in contact with them directly, or you can just talk to us afterwards about the information. <clears throat> and pass.org careers uh, does have job open opportunities out there. If you are interested, feel free to check them out. And now we go into the uh, virtual groups that I was talking about. Uh, there are always, if you go to pass.org, uh, there are always tons of interesting uh, seminars going on, either supported directly by PASS or by some of our other community groups out there. Uh, There's more. Wow, September is a full month. Yeah, it looks that way. And then there's more. And the technology, I don't know if that's the local one or not, but. Not sure. And one last page. Our next slide. There we go. There is a list of some of the greater uh, parent organizations that have different seminars out there that we connect through. So uh, feel free to check out pass.org, especially if any of these interest. Uh, I'll make sequel Saturday. Uh, hey, Wausau is the next one weekend. Wow, this weekend. This weekend. Yep. Anyone here part of the part of the team for the Wausau sequel Saturday? Want to say anything about it, quick? No. Guess not. <laughs> and. And we are pass.org in general, and fox at pass.org is our direct email address. Uh, normally, we have uh, I've written the names uh, questionnaires for you to fill out and tell us how Jared did as a speaker, and also uh, request any future topics you might be interested in us covering. Uh, unfortunately, our contact at uh, Paul at Skyline does, is not here today to help us print things off, so we don't have them. So. If you have, again, just email us at fox at pass.org. Um, big thing is if there are topics you want to see covered in the future, uh, ping us there, let us know. Uh, Jared has presented before, uh, so I don't think he's going to fail, but if you do have uh, any constructive criticism or, uh, or pass on the back that of what you want to send in, feel free again to email us there and pass them along. And now for Jared's presentation. No pressure, man. Jeez. <laughs> Oh, he's presented before. He knows what he's doing. <laughs> That's what you think. All right. Uh, let me get up my deck and minimize that because that's boring. And let's jump in. All right. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, as has been mentioned before and what you got in emails and such, my name is Jared Keene. I'm from Skyline Technologies. And tonight we're going to be talking about when low-quality data strikes uh, fuzzy tools provide clarity in matching and deduplication. So I don't remember if there was a bio that went out with uh, the information about today's presentation, but let me give you the lowdown of what's important to know about me. First of all, I like BLT sandwiches. Why is this important to know? If you find yourself in any reason when you're trying to get on my good side, BLTs, fantastic way to get started. Food for thought. Fine. Nobody cares. Uh, second, uh, male pattern baldness. So uh, in my spare time, I like to get involved in theater productions. I actually just finished doing a show this summer down in Nina. And uh, one of my more amusing theater anecdotes is back in college. Uh, my theater professor came up to me and said, hey, you're playing a 60-year-old doddering man. How about you want to give yourself male pattern baldness for three weeks? And me being the freshman in college, I'm just like, sure, why not? Uh, I got to see what I'm going to look like in 30 to 40 years, knowing that I'm ready to just let time slowly pass until I get there. 
Uh, let's see. On multiple occasions, including theater reviews, I've been mistaken as a lookalike for Aaron Rodgers. I, I don't see it either. That I don't see it. I leave it up to your interpretation, but apparently it's a thing. I, I cannot throw nearly as well as he can, so don't ask me to step in. Oh, man. What? What? Twitter? Um, so, uh, Weird Al is my hero. In case you haven't noticed already, I'm kind of a weirdy. Um, so I really look up to Weird Al, his use of parody, comedy, and uh, some really good music. I think he's a great guy. Um, I'm waiting for him to retire so we can start up a, a cover band of Weird Al. So that'd be funny. Uh, let's see. I'm also a bit of a hat collector. I have a hat rack at home with about 40 hats on it. Uh, I've got a chainmail hood, a little dragon, leprechaun hats. Hats for most occasions, not all yet. Um, and then I've got an adorable puppy and a cute dog. That's my daughter. Look at those chubby cheeks. That's my daughter, Ember. She is, uh, that picture's a little outdated. She's about uh, coming up on two and a half now, and my wife, Stephanie, on the right. Uh, not pictured there is the next bundle of joy, which is coming in December. And most importantly, look at that face. <laughs> That's my dog, Bowser. He's my snuggle buddy, which means he takes up my half of the bed. And uh, this is my no telling me I'm talking too much about nonsense. So let's get to our topic. Tonight's agenda, three simple items. Uh, this presentation is intended to be a very uh, built from the ground up core uh, understanding of fuzzy logic and uh, how you can start applying it in the technology world. We'll dig a little bit into technology, but honestly, the base presentation won't dig into it too much. If you have technical questions or any questions of any kind, feel free to ask at any time. I'll do my best to uh, field those questions as they come. But our agenda tonight, uh, three items. First, we're going to lay that base layer and understand what really is fuzzy logic. What are we trying to accomplish when we say we're doing fuzzy? Uh, once we establish that, we're going to talk about what are the typical matching approaches you would use in matching and deduplication scenarios. And then finally, hoping to spend most of the evening in demonstration, because especially with this concept, uh, it seems a lot better to show you guys what it looks like in a real-life scenario. Uh, so hoping to get to that sooner rather than later. So without further ado, let's jump in. First question, what is fuzzy logic? as if that picture isn't clear enough. Um, it's a little interesting if you try and do some searching online for what fuzzy logic is, um, because you find a lot of different definitions out there. Some of them are technology specific. Some of them focus on the, the mathematical components that go into coming up with a fuzzy algorithm. But even within that, there are definitions all over the place about what really is fuzzy logic. So I decided to add my own definition into the mix and try and simplify it into more of a general understanding. Fuzzy logic, as I see it, is about taking two pieces of information and identifying a match based on how similar those pieces of information are. Here's a non-technical example. About three or four minutes ago, I presented you with a slide of information I thought was important to identify who I am as an individual. So if I ask you right now, how would you identify me? Can you remember anything right now from that slide I just presented? Weird, yes, I'm weird. Huh? Aaron Rodgers, good. You bring up the Aaron Rodgers. It's, all right, so we got the celebrity stuff. Anything else? Wife Stephanie. Yes, Stephanie. You got my wife's name. I'm so proud. And Bowser. And Bowser, yes, my darling Bowser. Either the video game character or the old bay singer. Both are acceptable references. Um, all right, so. I mean, taking a quick look at the, the things that you just responded, I think we can all agree that you guys did a pretty good job of representing who I am as an individual based on what I presented before. Now, why am I wasting your time with this? It's because what this exercise we've just gone through is really fuzzy logic in its basis form. We take the definition I provided before. We took two pieces of information, the slide I presented before and your memory, and compared information that we remember from both sources to see how similar they are and see if we can identify a match. And that's really what you're trying to do with fuzzy logic. It's saying that even if things don't 
uh, match exactly. You guys use different phrasing from what I did explaining it or on the slide. But on the whole, with our you know, group algorithm here, we can agree that you guys uh, nailed who I am. And so that's what we're trying to do with fuzzy logic. Make sense? All right. So that's a very non-technical scenario that's all about silly shenanigans. Uh, how would we apply this in the technology world? At this point, I'm going to present a case study. This is going to be the basis of our discussion and our demonstration for the evening. Uh, it's a scenario I've run into in a couple times where I've had to evaluate algorithms, and in some cases, at least, I've determined that going a fuzzy approach saves you some headaches. So perhaps this is a scenario you've run into. Uh, let's see if you uh, can associate with this. The case study we're going to talk about tonight is imagine you're, a scenario, you're in a scenario where you're working for, uh, as part of a business intelligence group for some company other than AdventureWorks, because AdventureWorks is used way too much. Um, but you're, you're part of your business intelligence group, and you're being presented with two data sets of people that are important to your organization. Could be customers, could be employees, partners you work with, you know, any sort of customer list. Uh, now, like your typical person list, these contain names and demographic information about these people. So first names, last names, date of birth, social security number, gender, addresses so on and so forth. Now, one of these data sets is actually not new to you, and it's coming from your company's main application. You've worked with this for a while, you have direct access to the application developers, and so in the end, you've been able to already incorporate this data into your warehouse, and it is high quality. All the fields are filled in, formatted nice, um, nice complete that utopia of data that you would like to deal with. And it's important for your organization because reporting on these people is a very core root metric of your organization in how they make their decisions. Now, the second data set you're being presented with is coming from a new application. You haven't had a lot of time to look at it yet and don't really have access to the developers, but by doing an initial look, you've identified the data as low quality, hence the, uh, the topic tonight. Now, when I talk low quality, there's certain qualities that I'm identifying that are your problem points. First of all, typos. Um, your freeform text fields where, uh, you know, your first names, there's really few rules in the application about what is an acceptable value, no checks in place, and so you end up with typos. You know, everybody fat fingers uh, from time to time. Uh, you could be dealing with blank fields. For example, this new application um, some of this demographic information may be optional. It doesn't have a need for it. Um, so that can also cause you challenges uh, for what we're dealing with here. And also varied formatting. Uh, if you got 100 developers in a room and asked them how to store social security number or phone numbers or any data out there that has formatting on it, you may get 15 or 16 different answers on how it should be stored. And so, and Sometimes developers may not care and leave it as another freeform text field, in which case then you get what you get. Um, and so between those three, you can run into a lot of challenges um, as far as data quality goes. So that's what we're looking at when we're calling it low quality. Now the important thing to note about these two data sets is that a person can exist in both lists. So our goal is that we want to keep our uh, existing customer data clean, and uh, we want to be able to merge these two lists into one master person data set, you know, complete our data set, but still keep it clean and avoid any sort of duplicates or bad matches. And bad matches would be if Joseph Smith matches to Bob Taylor and, you know, one of them, or they get identified as the same person. That's obviously a problem. So the challenge in this case study really becomes how do we identify the people that exist in both lists? We're dealing with two separate applications, so we have no guarantee of there being any sort of numerical key that would allow us to easily tie between them. So unfortunately, we need to rely on the business data that exists, the names and the demographic information, to find matches. So how could we go about doing this? 
I'm going to at this point give a brief overview of three very basic approaches you could take from an algorithmic perspective to find matches. Uh, those will be exact matching, fuzzy matching, and manual matching. I'm also giving honorary mention to Match Game in that Alec Baldwin is really funny as a uh, host on that show right now. But while it's certainly a funny premise, I would not trust celebrities on alcohol to find matches between your important business data sets. Just saying, but still funny. So let's go over each one of these at a very high level and we'll dig into them a little bit more once we get into our demonstration. First one is exact matching, which is probably the most familiar approach to the people in this room. In an exact matching algorithm and its base form, what you're looking to do is you're trying to define columns that you want to compare between your two data sets. So if both data sets have first name, you can compare those. If they have last name, compare those. Social security number. Go on down and down the row and define columns that you want to compare. Now a given set of making that comparison, we're going to call a rule. And that's just to say, uh, as far as this algorithm goes, either you fit the rule or you don't. Now if you in order to determine that, whatever columns we define in that rule, the data in those columns must match exactly defined matching records, hence the name exact match. You know, this is your, your SQL joins, this is your more SQL joins. Um, <laughs> we, we do a lot of SQL joins. Now the benefit of going with this route at a high, at least at an initial level, is you are able to define very strict rules for whether you successfully find a match or don't. If you pick five or six columns in each of your data sets to compare and they match exactly, you can be fairly confident that you found a match as long as you pick smart columns. And conversely, if you do not find a match by that criteria, you can be fairly confident that you shouldn't have found a match in that case. The other benefit is if you're defining very strict rules like this, you can define multiple rules and run them in succession to further define a more elaborate algorithm. That's going to be especially beneficial here because with low quality data on one side of our match, uh, we're going to probably run into some challenges with finding one exact rule that works for all cases. So that'll be one benefit and we'll dig into that later. Fuzzy matching uh, is the second approach we could take. It starts similar to an exact match where we're going to define the columns that we want to compare between our two data sets. The difference is, is that instead of expecting the data to match exactly, we're going to use fuzzy logic. We're going to expect the data to match based on similarity. Now what exactly does that mean? Matching on similarity is going to depend on whatever tool it is that you're using. A lot of them will use some sort of percentage comparison. Um, but I've seen some other ones that use some really weird math stuff that I'm not going to pretend I understand. Um, but the important thing to note is that we're trying to implement fuzzy logic, which means we're looking for similarity rather than exact matching. In my experience working with a fuzzy algorithm, it's much faster to set up for complex, low quality scenarios, which just so happens to be what we're dealing with today. Um, and ultimately is better at handling low quality data. Um, it takes less time to set up uh, from an initial standpoint and uh, might get you a little bit further than exact matching, but we'll, we'll obviously that depends on your scenario. Third option is manual matching. This is trusting your business user to take two Excel sheets, put them side by side, and make matches between your two data sets. Uh, sounds convoluted, but honestly, if you think about it, um, it might be better in a matching situation to trust the human brain to find accurate matches because unlike any other algorithm we define, the brain, especially a business user who is familiar with your data, will be able to account for any number of variances that exist in your data, high quality or low, and would be ultimately your most accurate form of matching. The obvious downside is the larger your data set, the longer it's going to, the longer it's going to take. So typically we're, we're not going to go this route much. Um, and honestly, in most elaborate matching situations, you're probably looking to still have this as part of your workflow, but you're trying to minimize the need for this by implementing either an exact algorithm or a fuzzy algorithm. Any questions so far? I know this sounds like rocket science, but it's not. 
Just kidding. I know it doesn't sound like rocket science. All right, let's dig into our demonstration, shall we? Uh, I'm a little too close to my mic. I'm sorry. I have a big voice. All right, demonstration. Um, first of all, quick show of hands. Um, how many SSIS fans are out there? SQL Server Integration Services. All right. For for all the people who didn't raise their hands before you lynch me. Um, the demonstration I'm showing tonight is using SQL Server Integration Services to come up with uh, implementation of our matching algorithms. By no means am I suggesting this is your only option. In fact, I will present after our demonstration what some other tools are that you might want to consider in the SQL world. Just in my experience, these tools give you some interesting metadata that's beneficial to work with for, as far as an algorithm refinement process goes. and uh, it's one that I has been tried and true for me. It's a little bit simple, but it works. So before we dig into SSIS, let's take a look at our data sets. So at this point, I'm going to shift up my terminology just slightly. Um, so again, we're talking about two applications, two data sets. Our high quality, uh, trusted data, and our low quality, uh, ugly data. Um, at this point, I'm going to refer to that first data set as a reference index. Second one is going to be a source index. Now, as the name implies, index, ideally when you're dealing with a matching situation, you would already have your two data sets deduplicated. Um, because the, the, more dedu or the more duplicated it is, the harder it's going to be to find accurate results from your algorithm. So, ideally, that's what you're shooting for. Um, as far as reference and source, that's terminology I've seen used in a couple of different tools. Um, and I mean, they're fairly straightforward. Reference index is the app or the data set we're going to reference to see if we can find a match between our two data sets. Source index is going to be the data set going through our workflow. It's the second data set, low quality. We're trying to find if matches exist. So let's take a quick look at these two sets here. I'll zoom in for you. Alright, so what I have up on the screen right now, this is our reference index. So this data set, for the most part, is going to be staying stationary. We're fairly confident that we want to keep this data, so we're not going to move it anywhere. Instead, we're going to leave it there and use it as a reference to find matches from our other data set. And taking an initial look at things, things look pretty clean. I mean, other than an address to uh, the data's fill up pretty completely. Date of birth and social security number are uh, formatted. Although I think there's one 10 digit social security number. That's not supposed to happen. Um, there's one country where there's a U instead of US. Um, and otherwise, I mean, just taking a quick look at first name, last name, there aren't any typos that are sticking out as glaring problems. So again, High quality data set, not a whole lot of issues here. Let's take a look at our source index. All right, we'll bring this up a little bit. All right, and isn't this a beauty? Um, so this data set, we take a look at it, and there's a couple of issues we can identify pretty quickly. First of all, it looks like we've got a couple fields that are fairly optional. Um, this record in particular has half of its fields filled in, including the key from its application. Um, so that's going to potentially cause a problem. Um, Social Security number, it looks like it was a freeform text field. They couldn't agree on uh, any rules for formatting. Um, there is uh, the zip code. They couldn't necessarily agree on whether they should have gone with a uh, nine-digit zip code or five-digit. Um, someone decided to put it in the state of Moana. <laughs> no, I do not have a two-year-old daughter that is hooked on this movie right now and will watch it three times a day. <laughs> okay, moving on. Um, so, all in all... The sorts of fields that we would rely on as being consistent ways of being able to identify matches between these two data sets, we can see this data set's going to give us some trouble. You know, trying to create a rule around social security numbers and date of births, 
and such when we can't necessarily agree if those fields even exist or not, um, or at least if they're populated with data, it's going to cause us some issues. So let's see how we might work around that. In which case, we will actually get into our SSIS package. Demo gods, be with me. All right, so in this SSIS package, nothing really complicated going on so far, but I've got uh, three algorithms I'm going to be running side by side on these two data sets. The first two are uh, our fuzzy algorithm and our exact algorithm. The third one here is a fuzzy grouping algorithm. I'm not going to dig into that really at the moment. I'll come back around to that one later on in this demonstration. So what does it take up to actually set up one of these algorithms? Let's dig into our exact matching since that's a scenario we're a little more familiar with. And uh, it looks like there's a, quite a bit going on in this workflow, a lot of different stuff flying around. But honestly, it's a fairly simple workflow. What we're doing here is, again, as I said, reference index is going to remain stationary. We're not touching this. So what we're creating here is a workflow of how we're going to evaluate our source index data to see if we can find matches in the reference index. So at the top, we've got our source index. We're pulling in our records from there. At the bottom, we're sending them to a different table with uh, results and whether matches were or were not found. The rest of this is really a repetition of these two items here, which the left is uh, uh, just a custom item I made to append some metadata to these uh, records. We'll see uh, the value of that a little bit later. And otherwise, our rules for our exact algorithm are defined in these three components here. This is just your basic lookup transformation in SSIS. So if we think about our data workflow, it's for all of our source index records. We're going to take them and we're going to compare them against our first rule, see if we find a match. If we find a match, we'll append metadata to it, send it to the destination. It doesn't need to be evaluated anymore. If we don't find a match, we're going to send those records to our second data set or our second rule. We're going to do the same thing. If we find matches by that rule, append metadata, send to destination. If we don't find a match, send it to the third rule and do the same thing. And for this algorithm, I decided to stop at three rules because these took a little while to set up. So if we don't find any matches by either of these three rules, we're going to say that these uh, source index uh, records have no match in the reference index. So theoretically, if I wanted to continue refining this, I could create nearly infinite uh, matches or nearly infinite rules for all of the different scenarios you might find in your data. It really depends on how much time you want to take. This, at least including a little time of setting up tables, took me maybe an hour to two hours. So what does it take to set up a rule? There's a couple of really technical components for SSIS I'm going to gloss over and just focus on what does it take to actually implement the, the logic behind the algorithm. So first thing we need to define on this page is how to handle rules with no matching entries. You know, a lot of lookups we do in SSIS, we want them to succeed, and if they fail, we've got a problem. In this case, um, we failures are acceptable because we shouldn't necessarily expect our data to match exactly by this criteria. Um, so we're just going to say we're going to redirect it to a different output, which gives us the opportunity to pass the data to another rule or whatever workflow comes after that. Next thing we define is what is the data set we want to compare to to see if we can find a match. Uh, as I said before, we're talking our reference index in that case, so just referencing that there. And then final page here, we are looking at our two tables here. So our source index is on the left. Um, presenter mirrored stuff. Yes, that is the left. I'm looking at it the same way. I'm, uh, it's been a long day. <laughs> um, so source index is on the left. Reference index is on the right. Uh, in this field, or in this part of the, uh, the editor, we're trying to define two things. First of all, we're trying to define the columns we're going to compare that define our rule. 
which is identified by all the horizontal lines between our two data sets. So this first rule is very aggressive. It's saying if all of the business columns match exactly, we've got an exact match. That better be true or logic is weird. Um, so we're going to define that as our first rule. And the only other thing we have to define here is when we successfully find a, a match, what do we want to return to identify that a match was found? Um, so in this case, we are going to add a new column to the data set. We're going to uh, look up to the person key, the unique key on the reference index table. And uh, we're going to pass it through as a new column called person key match. Now for our final results, we don't necessarily need this. All we need to identify is that a match occurred. Um, this uh, I would still recommend doing regardless because as far as evaluating our results, this gives us a way to join between our source index and reference index to see how well our algorithm worked. Any questions on that so far? I know, this is still super crazy stuff. Yeah, I know. All right, uh, let's take a look at our next two rules. So our second rule it's going to be much simpler. We're just going to trust that if social security number matches between our two data sets, we have a match. Yes, significantly different from the last one. And our third rule is going to be first name, last name, date of birth. If those three columns match exactly between our two data sets, we've got a match. And that, in short, is the exact algorithm. So let's look at what a fuzzy counterpart would look like. By an initial look, it's pretty quick to see significantly fewer components. Same as the last one, we're moving our source index through our workflow. So we've got uh, our source identified at the top. Our bottom is our results table, which stores the results of our algorithm. Otherwise, everything else in SSIS is contained within this fuzzy lookup transformation, which is naturally available in SQL Server Integration Services. So let's dig into this a little bit and see what a fuzzy algorithm looks like. First of all, we're going to start at the same spot as we did with our exact matching. What table are we going to look up to to find a match? So we're pointing at reference index again. Next page, we're going to do the same thing we did with our exact matching, which is identify what columns we're going to compare and uh, what we return if we find a match or not. So this is going to mirror the first rule of our exact algorithm. It's going to compare all columns, but it's going to be looking for similarity instead of an exact match. And as with the other algorithm, we're going to be returning the person key of the reference index uh, if we find a match, again, for debugging purposes. So how does this differ? It really differs on this one tab right here. So let's talk a little bit more about fuzzy logic. Our first option here is defining maximum number of matches to output per lookup. Seems a little weird to be defining something like this, but let me explain. Um, theoretically, we could uh, set this up to higher numbers. We're going to leave this at one for the time being. What exactly is this telling us? It really boils down to what fuzzy logic is trying to accomplish. If you think back to our exact matching algorithm, what we were doing with our workflow is taking a given source index record, making a comparison, and if it succeeds, we send it immediately to the destination. We don't reevaluate it. We don't do anything else with it. We found a match, it goes to the destination, boom, done. Since we're finding uh, matches by similarity with a fuzzy algorithm, we don't necessarily have the same luxury. In this algorithm's case, we're going to be trying to calculate a percentage of how similar a given source index record is to a reference index record. Unless we happen to get a 100%, we have no guarantee that we found the best one if we just look at the first index record which means that for each source index record, we have to make a comparison to each record on the reference index. So we're essentially doing a cross join here. And for each combination of source index and reference index, we're going to compare them and calculate a percentage on how similar they are. The 
In this case, anything close to 0% means they have little to nothing in common. Anything closer to 100% or 100% means we found an exact match. So if we think about it that way, this, um, this first option really pre prevents us from returning a source index record with a match for every reference index record that exists. Because otherwise, they will all get evaluated. Each combination will have a percentage. We need to figure out what's the best one to return, which is what this algorithm is trying to do. So this first one is to say, OK, for regardless of the number of reference index records that exist, give me the best match, the highest percentage match that I found in the reference index. Second thing we have to set here is a similarity threshold. So as I said, we're going to have percentages for anything from 0 to 100%. And the first option is going to say return the best one. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's a good one. I mean, that could return something close to 98%. It could also return something close to 20 30% as that being the best match. And if that occurs, more than likely those lower percentage ones, we don't want to associate those as a match because more than likely they aren't. So what this threshold allows us to do and say, OK, based on what I know about my data, I'm going to set this threshold. If the best match or the best reference index match has a higher percentage than this threshold, we're going to accept it as a match and pass it on that a match was found. If the best reference index percentage is below our threshold, we're going to say that source index record did not find a match. So at least this helps us do an initial filtering of some of those bad matches that could be found with this algorithm. <coughs> Final thing here to define is token delimiters. I've tried to do some searching on this online, and um, honestly, there's not a whole lot of documentation on this and the algorithm that goes on in the background. For whatever reason, Microsoft doesn't want to talk about how this fuzzy logic is implemented. It's just telling you, hey, it does this. What this at least is telling us is that uh, it wants us to pay attention to token delimiters. Basically, if you're dealing with any situation where your data has some natural formatting in it, for example, social security number, if it has the dashes in there, this gives you a way to identify that. What it allows you to do, or what it allows this uh, transformation tool to do is when it's trying to figure out those similarity percentages, it's going to try and break down your data into as small of tokens as it can identify and compare those tokens side by side to identify the match. The smaller the tokens it can find, the more accurate your results are going to be. So if you know that formatting exists in your data naturally, take advantage of that, identify that here, it should give you better results. And that's honestly all there is to that. Um, setting this one up took me maybe 15 minutes. So all in all, even at just a very low level here, this one took significantly less time to at least get up and running for an initial run. The exact lookup, you know, maybe I could have saved some time by just focusing on one rule for my initial run, but I wanted to be a little more um, judicial about that. And so, you know, at least for an initial setup, fuzzy lookup's probably going to take you a little bit of less time. Um, food for thought. Beyond delimiters, is that fuzzy logic extensible? Can you extend that to like regex or other uh, matches or match? Can you extend the algorithm? Is what I'm getting at. Is it okay. Um, yeah, so for those on the phone or on the interwebs, um, the question is, can you extend this feature um, to do some sort of regex analysis? This particular tool, you cannot. Um, well, I'll talk about that a little bit more um, when I talk about some of the op other options you have in SSIS. Oh, not in SSIS, in SQL Server. We're already talking about SSIS. Come on, brain. Um, so there isn't a way of extending this tool in particular, but there are other approaches you could take to come up with a solution that would be extendable in that respect. So let's execute these and take a look at our results. 
So our data sets are small. This doesn't take very long to run. Um, obviously, the larger the data sets, the longer this is going to take to run. One caveat I will uh, reference now, since this is more of a technical group, and we're technology people, the fuzzy lookup transformation. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't give you a lot of control around this. And I don't know if Microsoft chose to do this for performance or what. Um, but one thing to note about that algorithm is when it is comparing your source index and reference index, in order to complete that, it needs to load your reference index into memory in its entirety. So if you have a very, 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 very large uh, reference index, it may take a little while to run and also be careful, it might overload your memory. Not that I'm speaking from experience. <laughs> um, but just one caveat I would mention about this tool. So, but those algorithms ran, so let's take a look at our results. Let's take a look at our exact results. So what you're going to see here is our source index records in their entirety with two additional columns on the end. First one, person key match, that's the one we identified in the tool before. And when a number exists, that means that uh, our algorithm found a match and that uh, number lets us join into the reference index to uh, do some evaluation on how good our algorithm was. The uh, second column there matched on rule, that's the metadata that I appended personally, which lets me identify uh, of the rules that I defined in my algorithm, which one did these uh, records match on. So we can quickly see of the like 15 or 16 records we evaluated, three of them matched on all columns. Fantastic, we have some exact matches. Three of them matched on social security number alone. And then finally, we got one match on date of birth, last name, and first name. So about half of them got matches. That's decent. Now, if I wanted to blindly trust my results and just say, all right, this is good enough. Give me my final data set. I can easily do some not-so-fancy SQL wizardry to union those together, remove any of the columns or records that we found matches on and have a final data set looking like this. And at least, so what we can initially take a look at with this view is did we uh, deduplicate our data? Did we end up with any uh, duplicates, in which case our algorithm missed some matches that it should have found? Uh, quickly, we can see there was a will testament that was in both data sets. Um, and also Kronk Kranken uh, apparently was in both data sets, and we didn't find those matches. So if we wanted this to be rock solid and find everything possible, we missed a couple. Our algorithm wasn't good enough to find uh, all the matches we wanted to find. Another way I like looking at this is, did we find any bad matches? Because that is also a possibility with any matching algorithm we find. So I created another view here, and this one joined our uh, source index and reference index side by side, column by column, to let us see by each column how similar was our data. So the first three, they matched on all columns. We're not going to worry about them because they matched on all columns. Let's take a look at those social security number matches. First one, we've got Danny, last name significantly different, Prozit Gemütlichkeit. At least they're strong German names. Um, so we've got that going for us. Um, the dates of birth at least match, uh, the social security number obviously matched, and uh, let's zoom back in there. Uh, and that third record, the, the address 222 Calm Springs Drive looks accurate in both. So by uh, running that social security number check, this match seems to be a good one. We found a good one. You know, possibly this person went through a name change recently for some reason. It was reflected in one application and not the other. Let's take a look at this next one. Harry Houdini, a uh, typo in the last name, missing an O. But the dates of birth uh, match in both. Social security number obviously matches. And uh, apparently somebody got their uh, magical terminology missed matched when they were entering data in one of the systems. 
So there again, can do a quick manual matching approach to that and say, yeah, we feel good about that match. How about this third one? We've got will, first name, so that's good. Trespassers and Testament, reasonably close, but not a little questionable. Uh, we've got date of births that are 62 years apart, um, but their social security numbers match and their addresses do not. Uh oh, we may have found a problem. And this was one that I put in intentionally uh, because it's a scenario that younger me decided was a good idea and then in practice found this isn't smart. And this really boils down to what I was mentioning before about defining strict rules. If you define really loose rules like this, you even if it's exact matching, which we would all typically trust, you know, everything matches exactly, if you don't define your rules well, you run the risk of introducing bad matches into your data. So this is a scenario where we had two people match that are in fact two different individuals. We lost one of those people from our final data set. And then finally, the one for date of birth, first name and last name. So obviously date of birth, first name, last name uh, works. And we were able to account for the fact that in the one system, they didn't have their social security number listed which prevented them from succeeding on either of the two rules that were evaluated previously. So on the whole, as a first run, this algorithm does okay. There are a couple of duplicates that were we identified in the previous view. We would want to see if we can define rules to find that and remove that to refine our algorithm. And also we found a rule that isn't working well for ourselves. So for our solution, we would be looking to either um, get rid of that rule in its entirety or add in additional columns to make it a much more strict uh, rule for our algorithm. But on the whole, not so bad for a first start. That's enough exact stuff. Let's talk fuzzy. So we'll do it in sort of a similar approach. Again, our first, our data set is going to be our source index again. Uh, but we're going to have a lot of extra metadata columns which are naturally available as a result of this tool. Let's talk through these a little bit. First of all, the person key match. Again, that's the column that identifies that a match occurred and what record we match to in the reference index. Next is similarity. This is the percentage that the uh, transformation tool calculated uh, to identify that a match was present. So these are, we found three matches that were exact, similar to our exact algorithm, and then we found five matches that were at least somewhat similar, and it returned the ID for the highest percentage match that we found. Um, confidence, that is, I don't see that, it's used every now and then in the fuzzy tools I've seen. What it's really trying to tell you is, um, how confident, well, obviously, how confident the algorithm is that the match it found for you is the right one. How I would interpret this is saying, if this is closer to one, that means that the match I found is the best one, and the other matches, the lower reference index percentages we may have found in this algorithm, there was a significant difference from those percentages and the best one that we found. So this one seems to be distinct and also seems to be a pretty good match. So we can be confident that there was, uh, that the match we got is in fact a good one. If that percentage is lower, that would tell me that um, perhaps the reference index has a couple of records that are fairly similar to one another, and this algorithm wasn't sure which one to pick. It picked the one that it calculated was the best similarity, but it's not fully confident that it's the best one for you to find. That would be a situation where I would go back into the tool, maybe increase the number of outputs we return per match, um, so we can get a couple extra results returned, and uh, see what other columns we're finding strong matches on. Then the last ones here, I'll scroll over a little bit and zoom back in. And I glossed over this a little bit in the tool itself, partially because the fuzzy lookup tool does not make this incredibly visible, but I'll call it out here. Um, 
the algorithm naturally is going to make a comparison on all of the columns you define in your comparison it's also going to do it individually and the nice thing about this tool is it'll naturally give you a breakdown of how similar our records were um, by column so we can see for most of these the first names either they matched or they didn't this one we were able to find a match even though the last name had only one percent of similarity um, that's the I think the prosit gemütlich type match um, and down on, and then further down the row like even on stage you know we found a match even though the state only matched by one percent the thing that goes along with that which again the tool doesn't tell you very well but we defined a similarity threshold for all of the columns we compared. We also have an option in this tool to define individual similarity thresholds for each column. So we could define a rule that, or we could define our algorithm to say, if our algorithm finds a match like above 85%, but the last name doesn't match or doesn't have a similarity above 5%, we could theoretically exclude that match from our results set gives you a little more control and a little more finesse um, to rule out some of those bad matches that you could potentially find with this algorithm. So again, let's look at our final data set, see if we found any duplicates. And that's very small. Let's zoom in, shall we? And at least taking a quick look it doesn't seem like there there may be one or two duplicates that we still couldn't find so duplicates still exist in this algorithm we need to find some way of fine-tuning this a little bit maybe lowering the threshold a little bit to see if we can find uh, the match that's missing um, so at least we've got a little bit of a duplicate issue it doesn't seem quite as bad as the other one and let's take a look at these reference and source index tables side by side. So again, those top three matched exactly. We're going to gloss over those. You have a question, Adam? Is there a, uh, uh, a granular way to, and what you've shown us so far, to um, if something fell between like uh, 60 to 80 percent, so that there's like a, a good confidence, but it's enough question that we want this to be looked at by a user first. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a way to 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 sort like keep above 80, send 60 to 80 to something else, and then dump everything else out entirely? Great question. For those on the phone, the question was: um, Say we've got uh, we have a fairly low threshold, and we want to write rules that say if the similarity percentage is between say 60 and 80 percent. Uh, we may want to have those uh, matches evaluated by a user. Is there a way to do that? Um, not quite in the same way that the look or the exact transformation did, where we could immediately say if a match exists or did not exist, that we split them out different ways. We can't do it that way. What we could do, um, I mean, honestly, there are a lot of different ways that you can do this. The, what you're getting here is just the pretty much the raw output of the algorithm. So you could easily write, you know, uh, SSIS transformations on that similarity column um, and split things out that way. You could do it in stored procedures if you're going to keep the data in SQL. Um, it's not built into the tool naturally, but there are plenty of options you have available that once you get this data, you could define your own rules. And I've actually done that in the past where um, you set a threshold like this at about 50%, and if it's in the like 50 to 70% range, I send those off to a different destination and have those reviewed by a user. So it's mostly providing us extra, the tool is mostly providing us extra data to help us kind of analyze it. Yeah, yeah, I would look at it that way. This tool is giving you... Um, its initial best bet at what it thinks the best match is. And then for those that you're not quite sure on, it gives you additional metadata you can send on to your business users uh, to help them in their analysis. And then obviously any workflow you want to figure out from there on 
accepting their either confirming that it's a match or denying that it's a bad match. It's up to you to figure out how best to handle that. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Any other questions at the moment as long as we're stopped? Bueller, Bueller. That joke is overused. Uh, so let's take a quick look at these side by side. So again, the top three, we matched exactly. No big deal there. Um, this first one here, Kronk Kronken, that was one that our exact algorithm did not find by the rules that were defined. But other than the last name, the date of births match, social security number, um, it looks like one had it formatted, the other one did not, so our, our exact algorithm missed that. And the addresses look good, so that looks like a, a match that Fuzzy found. And, I mean, you're only talking a 96% similarity, so they weren't that different, but it was just they were different enough that our exact rules didn't catch it. Um, Danny, this is the one we looked at before, so we know that, you know, by an initial review, that data looks good. Uh, S, geez, man, that's a blast from the past. Um, <laughs> It looks like the exact algorithm might have been case sensitive. Um, so it wasn't able to catch the first name and the last name matching, even though one had the first letters capitalized, the other one did not. Uh, date of birth match, though, again, social security numbers. One was formatted, the other was not. Um, and their addresses are close, although one has drive spelled out, the other one is just DR period. So there again, a good match, but one that uh, we were able to easily find at 86% similarity that our exact algorithm wasn't able to find so far. Um, and then Johnny Cash, I believe, yeah, we evaluated that one before. That one looks good. And Harry Houdini we identified as well. So we found one or two extra matches that the exact didn't find. And also the other important thing to note, we didn't find the bad matches that the exact algorithm found because we were trusting all of the columns, basing it on similarity, and allowed a lot more flexibility with it to make sure it finds the right one, not one that it thinks is close. All right, so all right, we're about an hour in. And uh, up until this point, I've just been talking about matching, but I, this presentation's matching in deduplication. So to avoid you guys feeling duped, let's talk about deduplication. Ah, play on words. I'm fancy like that. Um, so I've intentionally been ignoring deduplication for the most part, and that's intentional because as far as looking at things at this level, from an algorithm perspective, there's really little difference between a matching scenario and a deduplication scenario. Because really all we're talking about is in a matching scenario, we're taking two data sets, comparing them together to see what matches exist between the two. Deduplication is the exact same thing. You're just looking at one data set and comparing it to itself. So algorithmically speaking, it's Figuring out your best approach isn't any different from handling a matching scenario. It's just a question of are you comparing two data sets or are you comparing one to itself? Now for deduplication, this is where we're going to get into that grouping transformation that I glossed over earlier. This is another transformation natively available in SQL Server Integration Services. And it looks like this. The results are somewhat similar, but here's what this algorithm is doing. In an effort to deduplicate our data, it's taking the data set we presented it, which in this case is the source index, and it tried to group them, again, based on similarity. We're talking fuzzy here. Um, this first column here, key source index, this is uh, a unique identifier for each of the records that were evaluated. Key master record is what we can use for grouping. Anytime where we see this number represented multiple times, we know the algorithm found a grouping, aka duplicates exist. Um, and then from there, we've got our score, it's the third column, and that is, again, the similarity percentage. Here it needs to be interpreted slightly differently. Any of those that match one 
or 100% means one of two things. Either one, no duplicates existed, in which case it matched to itself and it found that it was exactly the same as itself. Go figure. Um, or if we find a one and it is part of a grouping, it is a duplicate record that happens to match exactly with whatever is identified as the master. Um, I would not necessarily trust the name master as far as how this algorithm goes, because what it, I haven't figured out exactly how it identifies what the master is, other than I think it's actually just looking at which order you evaluate your records in. But I wouldn't necessarily trust it, because if we look at the two duplicates we found here, um, the master for this one is this Jenny, which I've never seen Jenny with two Ys. Um, but at least this one, it seemed like weird Yankovic, you know, pick the one without two Ds. So we can say, you know, at least the one we probably could trust that that's the master record we would want to return. Um, the first one, uh, we probably would not want to trust that. So when I've used this in the past, I at least will use this to identify the groups and the potential duplicates you ex that exist. And then I have to write my own logic to figure out which one's the best one that I actually want to keep. It's unfortunate. I'm not sure why they don't give you a little better control over identifying that master, but I've looked through the tool and it doesn't seem to exist for this one at least. But I think if we look at these two duplicate scenarios side by side, I mean, the, the data is 96 and 97 percent similar. So we were able to find these duplicates in the source index we could remove those duplicate records and start out with an ideal index, as uh, we talked about earlier. Any questions about that? Drum roll, okay. All right, demo over. Let's uh, wrap this up with a couple more slides. So, the question that's often asked in this scenario, which approach do I pick? Well, unfortunately, we're talking about tools, so I'm not going to tell you. Um, as with any sort of tool, some tools work better for certain situations and some uh, work better in other situations. So it's really not a question of what is the best tool to use. It's really what makes sense for the situation you're dealing with. So what I would ask instead is these two questions to figure out which one makes more sense. First of all, how much time do you want to invest in finding accurate matches? If you've got infinite resources, infinite time, and you've got business users up the wazoo who want to analyze your data for you, why bother writing an algorithm? Just let them deal with it. Obviously, we're not dealing with finite or infinite uh, resources, so that sort of manual matching approach doesn't make sense. Um, if you're very restricted on time, you don't necessarily have time to refine your algorithm, and you want to at least create something close to what you need, but may still have some data issues with duplicates or bad matches found, exact matching might be the better way to go. It's simpler to set up, it's closer to what we know uh, as SQL developers, um, and ultimately as long as you define those strict rules, you can run that and feel uh, strongly that whatever matches you found, you should have found, and if you didn't find them, there's a pretty good chance that you shouldn't have. Um, the other thing you might want to consider is what resources are available for you to use, and I'm especially talking business users. As Adam brought up before, um, the SSIS tool I brought up tonight um, with fuzzy logic and with low quality data gives you a very good start on finding accurate matches between your two data sets. And if there's a certain similarity threshold area that you're not so sure about, you can easily just take that data, move it through a different workflow, send it off to business users, and have them evaluate it. If you have the time for that, you can build some really um, effective workflows uh, that you could theoretically automate and have your data getting constantly refined on a regular basis. So if you have the time for that, that's fantastic. But if you don't have that time, perhaps exact matching is a better route for you. So. You know, find, figure out the tool that's best for you. Uh, here's the slide I promised before. Uh, what other tools exist out there other than SSIS? Obviously, first option, SSIS. Um, 
any version 2005 and later, you've got those fuzzy lookup and fuzzy grouping transformations available, which unless you're using an unsupported version of SQL Server right now, you've got them at your disposal. Yes? Uh, is that enterprise only? I knew somebody was going to ask the license. Um, I, I, think, I, I think these might be enterprise for some of the earlier versions of SQL Server. I almost want to say they made them available a level down on some of the more recent ones, but I also might be misspeaking there. I'd have to look into that. I, I honestly don't know for sure. The, uh, for those on the phone, the question was about licensing, what licenses is this available for. Um, for some of the versions of SQL Server, I do know it is only available for enterprise, um, but I think some of the more recent ones, they may have it available in lower licenses. But don't quote me on that because I'm not fully certain. Um, so outside of integration services, if you're a SQL Server and you want to do everything in there, a um, couple things if you're dealing with some fuzzy or low data quality scenarios. First of all, you could turn on your full text search. Um, it's a little outside of the scope of like pure fuzzy logic, although pure fuzzy logic probably doesn't exist. Um, but it gives you some very interesting tools around analyzing character patterns, linguistics, and finding similarities there. For example, you can define rules around uh, if you expect your data to include street spelled out in its entirety, str period, and st period, this would allow you to define rules to consider them all the same thing. Makes your exact matching a little bit easier. Um, it is restricted to only text data, and also if you're dealing with multilingual data, gives you some controls around that as well, if you want to try and keep your data clean that way. Um, another option for the SQL Server people out there would be CLR function. If you like math or you like Googling fuzzy logic uh, CLR functions and trusting third-party code that nobody's tested, certainly an option for you. Um, I wouldn't necessarily trust the third-party stuff, but, you know, Really, all of the logic I presented tonight, it's really just doing mathematical analysis for that fuzzy work. So if you can figure out the algorithm, figure out a way to code it in uh, what other, whatever uh, custom dev uh, language you prefer, you could, in theory, do that and um, run that in SQL Server. It's an option. It would take a lot of work, I think, to get there, especially if you wanted some of the detailed information that we got from this tool, but I at least post that as an option. Uh, the next one, also a little bit of a tangent, but data quality services and master data services, um, especially if you're looking at scenarios where you're engaging your business users and you're looking to not just get your data clean initially, you want to keep it clean. Um, I would maybe take a look at these and see if the sorts of user interfaces they have available, the sorts of workflows you can build to feed data through these services um, would give you the tools you need to um, come up with automated solutions that can do some initial attempts at cleansing the data, but also give you reasonable workflows to present your data or your business users with data and help them uh, be involved in that process as well. Finally, if you have pro Excel users who just want to go off and do their own thing and uh, are having trouble with natural VLOOKUPs that they're trying to do on their own, there is a fuzzy lookup tool for Excel, free to download. Uh, I believe it works with Excel 2007 and later. Um, and it provides similar functionality to the tool that I presented tonight, um, just within Excel and within the tables that you define there. If that is something you want to consider, I highly recommend reading a blog post I wrote earlier this year where I did some experimentation with this tool. It does not work the same way that we were trying to use it for tonight's demonstration. There, are, I think there are some applications, especially if, like I said, that VLOOKUP scenario, if you've got business users doing that a lot, this could be a tool that helps if um, the, the VLOOKUP isn't working because it's an exact algorithm. So finally, in conclusion, because that's what every presenter says, Fuzzy Logic is another tool in your belt, but it's still just a tool. I think for me, I've uh, saved a lot of time by using this in some low quality data scenarios. 
Um, but don't hammer in the nail with a screwdriver. You, if you're, all your data is high quality and you can trust your exact matches or it makes sense for you for whatever your situation is, use it. You don't need to, to, to change your thought on that. Um, also, if you're looking to experiment with uh, algorithms in general, but I would say more fuzzy logic, plan on taking some time to experiment with it. I've been using the tool now for two or three years now. And even still, anytime I'm uh, presented with a new data set that I need to analyze, I'm going through and I'm starting from scratch, you know, picking some base metrics and just, you know, spending time refining it. That's why, personally, I like using it when it makes sense because it's faster to set up and you spend more time actually looking at your data and tuning your algorithm to what your data actually runs into. The exact matching, you have to do a little more setup up front and you're not necessarily guaranteed that uh, it always works the way you think it will. Uh, finally, if you are interested in this topic and would like to know more, uh, there is my email address. I gave it to Adam earlier, so he has that as well. So feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to answer any further questions you have on that. Um, check out the Skyline Technologies blog. I've been blogging on Fuzzy Logic for about two or three years now as well. And I had some interesting ex ex eh, excapades. I think that's the word. Uh, some interesting experiences with it over the years, and I'm planning on continuing to write about it as I learn new things. So keep an eye on that. Again, I'll point out that Excel add-in, if you're looking for a down and dirty way to get into this and just get started, it's a good tool to at least uh, start understanding the concepts, how you implement fuzzy logic, what you're looking for. Um, and then finally, if anybody is interested in the uh, scripts and packages I use today for uh, the demonstration. Um, I believe it's still out on the SQL Saturday Madison website. If it's not, feel free to hit me up at my email address. I'd be happy to share with you what I have. Finally, as Adam was bringing up before, um, so for me, I'm still a little new to presenting in the, the technology world. I spend most of my time doing theater as far as being in front of people and sharing more jokes there, more better written jokes because they're not written by me. Um, but this is a, an area that um, PASS has been a very great influence on my life. I've learned a lot from attending these user groups meetings, going to SQL Saturdays, and uh, this is me wanting to get out there and contribute back to the community and share information. It's something I have a passion for and I would like to do more of. But I'm not going to really know how best to do that unless I get some good feedback. So whatever feedback forms they have available, I know those like one to five grids are nice, but a number's not telling me a whole lot. I would be very, very, very grateful if you guys would be willing to take just a couple minutes, um, you know, write down some, some basic feedback, things you liked about this presentation, things you didn't like, maybe some topics around fuzzy logic and data quality that I didn't cover tonight that you feel would make good content for a presentation. I think there's a lot of things that me personally, I could see need to continue talking in the data quality realm um, that I could dig into, but I don't know if anybody really cares. So the only way I know that is by getting your feedback. So whatever form is available to get feedback, please just give me a couple minutes of your time, help me improve so that if I come back here in the future, I can be a better presenter for you guys. And with that, that's all I have. So uh, if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to ask them now. Otherwise, I'll hang around for a bit. All right. Thank you.